want to fit into these people without them. I want to be able to be like the culture. I want to be like this, like that. And so here I am, double-minded, just flapping in the breeze. Verse 9. Now the fun part. All right. Be miserable. Everybody ready? And yet the reality is... Can you think of a more miserable moment than maybe King David had? But he was sitting on his throne and Nathan the prophet walked in and tells him a story about a man who had a little lamb. It was the family pet. This lamb, this buddy doesn't get to do this. This lamb drank from his master's own cup. And the whole family loved this little lamb, Nathan says. And then the rich man down the road, he's got company. So he goes down to the poor man's house, gets the lamb, kills it, and serves it up for lunch. Oh, David, just went ballistic. <laughs> this guy has got to die. He's got things a little out of order if you look at the passage. He's got to die, and then he's got to pay him back four times what he took. I think maybe you need to reverse the order. Let him pay back the four times first, then kill him, right? And Nathan looks at David and says, he says, but you're the guy. Because you put your eyes at Hittite in the path of the Ammonite swords so that he could be killed and you could take his wife, Bathsheba, whom you had gotten pregnant. Miserable, you read Psalms 51 and see if you don't see miserable. <clears throat> because we're, we're people that need to deal with our sin. Not because we enjoy being miserable, but the only way to get past the <clears throat> ultimate thing where we're being eaten up by the reality of that sin is to deal with it. And sometimes it calls for mourning. It calls for weeping. It calls for taking away the front of the cheerful, happy person, it faking the joy, but allowing ourselves to experience the needed purity, cleansing. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. That's a powerful statement. First John chapter three, verse two. Beloved, we are now. Now we are children of God, and it has not appeared yet what we will be. In other words, what we'll be like in eternity. We know that when He appears, we'll be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope of seeing Him, being like Him, we have this hope, what do you do? Everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself. Dealing with our sin. Confessing it. Knowing that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. This is a work that God wants to do in my life and yours. Well, what, what is He up to? What is Jesus doing? Where is this going? Revelation 19 would be an example of that in verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Oh, wait. This is in heaven. This is after Jesus has called His church out of the world. And now those who were believers that had, had died, though they were people of faith, they died, they've been buried, He's brought them from the dead, put them in a resurrection body, He's changed those who are alive, He's brought them all home, and here they are in heaven, and it's for the marriage of the Lamb, because all of the true believers of all of history become the bride of Christ. And His bride has been made ready by Him, well, we know that's true, but what does the passage say? His bride has made herself ready. You see, there's a responsibility for you and I to walk in.
the circumstances or the blessing that God has given us, that we would make godly choices, that we would purify ourselves, that we would do our part knowing we could not do that in our flesh. There is no way. But in his spirit, we can. And so she's made herself ready. Notice in verse 8. It was given to her. See the part where he does? It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. Bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Boy, I tell you what. I don't want to be running around naked in heaven. Not about you. If it's the righteous acts of the saints, then we're wearing it. We want to be serving the Lord. And not for show. But from a heart of purity. I believe some things I'll, I want you to think about with me today. I believe that revival for Little Cypress Baptist Church has been on the heart of God for years. He's shown us. He's revealed himself to us. He's done miraculous things around us and through us. And we have been excited for that. And yet we've gone through times of valley. We've gone through times of struggle. But I believe God is getting very close to bringing us to an appointed time in the life of this church. And maybe in many other churches in our area to still faithfully preach and teach and minister the word of God. I believe that even the selection of experiencing God as a study here recently uh, was the thing, thing that God did just to help us refocus on that surrender to His will as a part of our love for Him. I believe that the work of redemptive church discipline and obedience to Jesus and the apostles is a part of establishing holiness in His church. Notice the word redemptive. Reflects the idea of love. The idea of helping each other. And you can find that in Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5. I believe that Jesus is calling us for purity in our relationship because we are his pride. Because the marriage feast of the Lamb is close. And I believe that we will experience mourning for sin, which God will reveal to us. Those sins that we are not aware of. And once we have dealt with that sin, we will experience great joy. I believe that time has come. I don't know if it's going to be this revival. I don't know if it's going to be two of you or five of us or all of us or a whole community. I don't know, but I believe the time has come. I believe that revival is coming for those churches who are clean vessels that the Lord can use to disciple the people. Who come to Jesus in another great spiritual awakening. I, I believe that that's coming. It's coming before Jesus steals us. I don't know if you're familiar with that passage. When it talks about us being caught up. If you actually look at the terminology of that. It is the word that they use for what a pickpocket does. He's going to steal us away. I guess that means we're going to look. <laughs> In all of these things, we really don't want to talk about how we get there by being prepared and dealing with our sin. And I want to tell you a story as we close. This is about a revival experience that happened in China and it hasn't been all that very long ago. The person who's speaking says that he opened his Bible to Romans chapter 2, verse 17. And in the passage, Paul was speaking, he said directly to him, But if you call yourself a Christian and rely upon the gospel, and boast of your relationship to God, and know his will, and approve what is excellent, and if you are sure you are a guide to the blind, and a light to those in darkness, a correction to the foolish. A teacher of children. You then who teach others. Will you not teach yourself? 
Now this is a missionary that's writing about this. The Holy Spirit used this verse like a sword to lay me open. He said to me, you're a hypocrite. You claim to be a Christian. What have you really done for Christ? The Lord said those who believed in him would have rivers of living water flowing from their innermost being. Do you have that kind of power? <clears throat> Cole Pepper, who is this missionary, said, I awakened my wife and we prayed through the night. The next morning at prayer meeting with fellow workers. Confessed pride and spiritual impotence. Saying his heart was broken. The Holy Spirit began to convict the others around of their sin. And they could hardly bear it. I watched their faces grow pale. They began to cry and drop to their knees. Or fall prostrate on the floor. Missionaries. Went to other missionaries. Confessing their wrong feelings. Toward one another. Chinese preachers, guilty of envy, jealousy, and hatred, confess their sins to one another. The revival spread through the seminary, the schools, the hospital, and the area churches. Perhaps the deepest impact came on Culpepper's friend, Wiley B. Glass, a respected missionary. As Glass sat in the meetings, the man's face suddenly appeared in his consciousness before him. It seemed that God was saying to him that he had a wrong attitude toward this person. Glass had to admit he hated the man for many years. And suddenly he came under deep conviction. You see, this man had insulted his wife. And he thought about the times, many times, that if he just had a chance to kill the guy for having so hurt his wife, he would do it. And so, in this moment, the glass ran to Culpepper fell on his shoulders, weeping, and said, pray for me. Pray for me. He could not even explain why. He just asked this other minister to pray for him. He prayed for him for a significant amount of time. The man never being able to exactly say what the issue was. And even after he left, he continued to pray for this man throughout the day and the next into the evening. The second day, Glass came running to him with joy on his face, grabbed him, wrapped his arms around him, and he said, Charlie, it's gone. And he said, what's gone? He said, that old root of bitterness. Thirty years ago, he insulted my wife and hurt her. And I have been walking around with this root of bitterness in my life all of this time. A servant of God should not feel that way. The Lord came to me and said, Are you willing for me to save him? Save that man? If you save him, when we get to heaven, just keep him on the other side of heaven. I don't want to see him. And he said as God worked in his heart and brought him to a place of understanding the redemptive purpose of God. He said, I came to the place where I told God, okay, when I go on furlough, if I can find him, and I'm going to. There's no chance you won't find him. <laughs> you make sure that you find him. If, and I can find him. I'm going to confess to him my hatred. And ask him to forgive me. And do whatever I can 
to make sure he is a child of God. And he said at that moment, everything changed. The burden flew away. And he said, Charlie, it's gone. It's gone. And so did he go through mourning? Did he go through a struggle with sin? Was it uncomfortable? Yes, but when it was all said and done, the sin was gone. The burden was gone. The hatred was gone. And there was a, a preparation on his part to have a zeal for God, to have a fervor for God that would cause him to be willing to go and to humiliate himself before a person who probably didn't care for him at all. Apparently not his wife either. Although sometimes as it happens when you get into those situations. Because I've done dumb stuff like that. And you go to that person to try to confess what you've done and everything. They don't have a clue what you're talking about. They don't remember it at all. It's like it's okay. God don't remember it. And you deal with it. What is revival? Revival is an opportunity where a sovereign God works in our life to set us free to walk in the joy of our salvation by unburdening us from sin. Father in heaven, thank you that you choose to do this. Lord, I, I pray that as we're sitting here today, and we know that we have some meetings come in Saturday and Sunday. We won't wait for them. We will, even in this room, ask the question, Lord God, what is it in my life right now that is standing as a barrier to the kind of life that you have planned for?